to this webinar on EU-Russia relations. Um, my name is Marie Dumoulin. I'm the director of ECFR Wider Europe program. And I'm joined for this discussion by Kadri Leek, who authored the policy brief um, on which we will base our discussion today, as well as Pierre Vimont, a former French diplomat and former um, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, cur currently a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, as well as Ivan Krastev, um, Chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia. Um, and as some of you may know, if they have read the policy brief, it is based on research conducted in all 27 EU member states by ECFR's network of associate researchers. And so we are very happy to be joined by three of them. Um, Adam Balzer from Poland, program director at the College of Eastern Europe. Susanna Wirk, um, visiting, um, sorry, visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund and Livia Franco, professor at the Institute for Political Studies um, at the Catholic University of Portugal. Maybe just to start this discussion, Kadri, if you can sum summarize the main takeaways of your policy brief so that we start from the same basis um, and then move to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. And thank you, uh, um, other speakers, for uh, joining us. Really a um, privilege to get your reflections on, on the paper. And the national research is, of course, paper is based on our input. We sent questionnaires to all 27 member states uh, and we got uh, answers back. Answers were maybe surprising in some ways. It turns out that Europe is actually much more on the same page than anyone expected. It was probably thought that if when Russia launches a war against Ukraine, European unity will be among early casualties. That has not happened. Uh, Hungary is the only EU country that harbors a drastically different view of the war, its causes and what to do about it. All the rest are basically on the same page, even though there, is a, there are differences on what exactly the two nuances, pace of uh, policy decisions, but by and large, the sentiment is, is shared. It is, however, leaderless unity. Uh, and that comes in stark contrast with the period after 2014, annexation of Crimea. Um, and I, we worked on another similar paper in 2017, 18. And back then it was evident that actually Germany uh, played an important leadership role in the EU. Germany was the focal point that brought other EU countries together. Now there is no such country. We ask about leadership positions. Germany, France and Poland all got a few votes, but there were many more countries who said that no one or other combinations of countries. Uh, Germany still exercises a strong gravitational pull, though, and it is interesting that Germany is not seen as a country that steers EU policies, thinks ahead and shapes policy, but actually many countries seem to be trusting Germany's um, domestic hesitation and domestic debates because they see themselves in those debates. Many of the countries where there are similar differences across the political spectrum, they gravitate towards Germany because that is a big country they feel affinity with. Uh, at the same time, Poland and the Baltic states are also often minded, as the country uh, <clears throat> mentioned, as the countries that offer moral leadership to the EU. But it's also noticeable that many countries are a little bit scared of the maximalist purist stance offered by risk wing of the Europeans. There is some feeling that they want to punish Russia and they think of nothing else, uh, nor other countries' interests, nor escalation. And France, uh, for many countries, also France is uh, a country to gravitate towards. Um, uh, maybe minus uh, some geopolitical designs of French leadership, uh, French 
position is seen as based on diplomacy, multilateralism, and sort of rational, down to earth. We also saw many networks of countries at work, and, and some of these are traditional. I mean, you would expect Nordic Baltic countries to cons uh, consult among themselves and Mediterraneans. But also the neutral countries uh, seem to look upon one another, uh, Ireland, Austria, Malta, trying to figure out how should formerly neutral countries behave in the conditions of a war. Uh, at the same time, Finland and Sweden, who cooperate anyway, are more joint than earlier by the joint beat to NATO. So it was interesting to sort of look at the anatomy of, of European unity. Uh, where are we united? Um, sanctions. Sanctions are unanimously supported. No one was about to go soft. And remind you, our questionnaires were, were done in early autumn when you know that was far from obvious that Europe will manage to get rid of its uh, dependency on Russian gas. Uh, Europe doesn't know, however, Europe doesn't have a theory of victory. We don't know what the end result of this war will be, what can we hope it to be, uh, what's the sort of best practical way to go about it, there are differences. We don't know what the world order will be like. It's significant that minority of countries think that the world order as we have known it after the Cold War can be restored, but what follows, no one knows. And also relationship with Russia. We do not know where this is going. Many countries view it as Putin's war, not something that stems from um, Russia's nature as an imperialist power or, um, or no one see, no one apart maybe from Hungary see it as, as Western fault. However, departure of Putin is also not seen as a solution. Uh, not many countries want to instigate regime change in Russia, but at the same time, no one can properly imagine cooperation with Putin's Russia in the future either. And we ask about the role of outside powers. It becomes evident that the role of the US is indispensable. I mean, US is really also offering the leadership that is absent in Europe. Uh, and that gives us reason to worry about what will happen if something changes post-2024 in the American leadership. Uh, but we don't quite know how the war will affect or should affect our relationship with China and also the global public opinion, outrage, outrage to countries elsewhere, Africa, Global South, you name it. In theory, we know, but this is something that matters. This is something we should work with. Uh, in practice, very countries, very few countries have made it their priority. I might stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Kadri, and thank you for keeping the time. Um, before we move to the other speakers, just a technical remark. Uh, we will unfortunately not be able to take interventions from the public, but we will take questions um, and you can use the Q&A uh, bo box um, to ask your questions and I will um, ask them to our speakers when we come to the um, Q&A um, section of our discussion. Um, Pierre, you've been involved in European debates on relations with Russia for a number of years now. Um, what, how do you see the latest um, um, developments and, and what is your reading of um, Kadri's policy brief on EU-Russia relations? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for uh, ECFR, for, for your invitation with uh, a great team of speakers um, who are there. And it's a pleasure to be there. And I, I, want, I, I will be short in my first uh, comments because uh, this paper is excellent. Uh, and I think it, is, it gives a very comprehensive and accurate review of where the uh, uh, EU member states stand at, at the moment. 
Um, my main remark would be, uh, despite the impression that we are on the same page and that the reaction from the EU member states and from the EU uh, as a whole has been quite proper and, and the right uh, adequate answer to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine with a feeling, strong feeling of unity, of uh, cohesion. Uh, all this seems to me to be very fragile. Uh, and it's on fragility that I would like to insist. I think the paper dwells on this time and again, saying that all seems fine on the uh, Ukrainian front with the uh, member states aligned together and pushing together with the right kind of uh, military, financial, humanitarian support. Um, the paper dwells on the fact that uh, here and there, it may be more complicated. And it's not only about Hungary, the, uh, the single outlier there. It's more about a fragility due to our political positions and the differences that are deep rooted at the moment. Let me just give you three or four example quickly so that you, you understand. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, fragility is there when you look at the cohesion of public opinion in, in, in the European Union at the moment. And you see it very well when you look at social networks uh, reaction, at political parties outside of the parliament, uh, national parliament's discussion. Um, and one very interesting aspect to me was the way uh, reaction, uh, public reaction came out immediately just after the decision to go ahead with the delivery of tanks from Germany, from Poland, from the United States. As the Ukrainians, rightly so, in my opinion, immediately came out saying, thank you, but then we need more. And we should start discussing, for instance, about aircrafts, uh, um, 516 and others, um, and other jet aircraft. The immediate Outroll, uh, outcry all over Europe was, no, not again. Are we going to start a new discussion on moving to one additional uh, stage of uh, weapons delivery? As a sort of um, fatigue coming to um, uh, slowly moving into the public opinion debate. And I think we have to be very careful about this. It's still very much there. And it's understandable. There is this deep contradiction at the moment in the European position. And by the way, also in the American position is that we both want to be in and out of this war. And we're in through our military assistance, uh, but we're out because, as we remind everybody, we're not belligerent, we're not in a war with Russia. And this sort of contradictory position, which has its own reasons, of course, um, makes it somewhat um, difficult to understand by the average citizens in Europe, um, uh, because it is a complicated situation to handle. Um, from a diplomatic point of view, from a military point of view, and from a political point of view. Second fragility, in my opinion, is our political unity. Uh, Kadri alluded to that a few minutes ago. Um, I, I would say it has a twofold. The short term, we may not agree exactly on what should be the end game for this war, but the military end game. Uh, and it's all the discussion, I won't dwell on this, the discussion about uh, uh, should uh, President Zelensky repeat time and again that he wants to take back Crimea, where should be uh, the uh, at the end of uh, uh, this uh, war, if we manage to get some kind of peace settlement, where should be the borders uh, at the end of the day? Should it be uh, uh, February uh, uh, 2022? Should it be 1991? so on and so forth. Um, if you start discussing this between the Europeans, they have found a way of avoiding the, the debate. They're saying time and again, it's for Ukraine to decide. Uh, but the truth is everybody has its own idea um, uh, about the end game there. And of course, it's the same thing with the long term. Kadri alluded to that. What do we do with Russia once, hopefully, we manage to get a peace uh, agreement? what will be uh, the kind of uh, enduring, lasting and fair, just peace uh, at the end of the day? 
how do we deal with Russia, which has always been a problem for many, many years, and even for many centuries inside of Europe? Are we going for an isolation policy, as I hear from some of our East European colleagues, and I, underst I understand that, and certainly this is what we hear from Ukraine also, or do we try once again to start a discussion on what could be a, a new stability order in, in Europe in the future. We haven't even started that discussion among European Union member states, and it's going to stay there for, for a long time. Um, a third impression of fragility is the, um, the uh, geopolitical status of Europe, the leverage, the geopolitical leverage of Europe today. Uh, We've seen it, obviously, on all this discussion with the tank issue. Um, Germany only moved when uh, the United States moved. And time and again, we have seen that. And uh, all the efforts, uh, European leaders, and Katri alluded to that, the leaderless um, Europe, and she's right. Uh, but it has a lot to do, in my opinion, that European leaders um, don't count very much for Putin. For Putin, what this is all about, it's his uh, conversation with the, the US and maybe also with China and from a different angle. Uh, but the European leaders are somewhat out of the picture and Europe is somewhat out of the picture when we're really trying to discuss geo, uh, geopolitical um, uh, uh, matters. Uh, even Europeans are looking at the US guidance if they're trying to look at, at longer term uh, issue. And it's quite interesting, I'm currently in New York where discussions are going on in the UN about what kind of resolution could be adopted at the end of, uh, of the day when we come to the first dreadful anniversary of the uh, uh, Russian invasion. Um, it's the uh, European diplomacy that is leading the game at the end of the day about what shape should this uh, uh, UN resolution eventually take um, when we come at the point of discussing whether we will underline in that resolution the importance of the peace plan put forward by Zelensky and how to keep the votes of the Global South on board uh, um, uh, with the uh, Western Alliance. All this um, is at the end of the day in the hands of the US diplomacy. And I find this quite striking that EU, in spite of all its effort, the European Union, hasn't been able to come up with its own single political voice in the, um, in the realm of um, the geopolitical world today. And one last dimension is precisely on this point with our relationship with, um, with the global south, as we say today. Um, Kadri and, 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 and the whole team who worked on, on this very good paper underlined that, that there was no effective response for the time being from the EU to this global answer to the Ukrainian war, how to get the global south on board with us in criticizing uh, Russia intervention. And here, quick mention about something that has struck me from the beginning. One of the first reaction that was a very interesting one when uh, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine, that was by the end of February uh, 2022, there was the first and maybe one of the only really uh, useful and interesting discussion at the UN Security Council. And there the Kenyan ambassador to the UN came in and made a very forceful speech. I think we all remember about that about the uh, uh, integrity of territorial borders uh, and about how Africa had managed to avoid opening the Pandora box at the end of the colonial period and just pushing back against uh, uh, modifying, revising all their international borders between African countries. And the message from Kenya was Russia should think more about this and should try to uh, grasp some wisdom out of that African experience. Why we Europeans haven't been able to take this on board? 
and try to have a, another way of discussing this whole Ukrainian crisis with African countries, um, that meant changing a little bit of our mindset and being more in the listening mode with African countries. And I think we have lost that opportunity in the time. It may still be there, and we should try to regain uh, that capacity to listen more and to work more with uh, African, Latin American countries. I think this is a, a real um, work, a, a, a real agenda where the Europeans could find a little bit of leverage and clout as they try to move forward. I've been quite too long, Mary, uh, and I stopped there for the time being. Thank you very much, Pierre, um, and thank you for reminding us that the unity that we've achieved so far is um, very fragile and needs to be uh, worked on. Um, Ivan, you've been working also on this um, issue of uh, European unity regarding uh, its policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. You've actually authored one of the most read ECFR paper last year. Um, which also concerned um, European reactions to the war in Ukraine, but based on a polling conducted in a variety of EU countries. Can you share your thoughts about um, EU-Russia relations and about um, what CAD represented from the power audit? Thank you very much. And uh, I simply want to second uh, Pierre saying that I do believe it's a very important and interesting paper, exactly because it is not simply trying to explain why Europe managed uh, to respond uh, in a much more unified way than many other expected uh, to the Russian invasion in Ukraine, but because it makes an attempt to try to see the future of the EU relations with Russia. And I'll start with a very simple observation. Now, when you look back, we can say that for the last 30 years, before the war started, we never had a Ukrainian policy. We only had a Russian policy. Uh, not in the way that basically Ukraine was not important, but anything that you're going to do in places like Ukraine and post-Soviet space in general was, you're doing this with the idea to affect Russia in one way or the other. Some basically not to irritate Russia, others to change Russia, but very much it was Russia-centered even when you're talking about Ukraine. Since the war started, we went to the other extreme. We have a Ukraine policy and we do not have a Russia policy. Basically, in a certain way, if you are going to summarize, and Kadri has done it very well, basically the European uh, uh, policy towards Russia at the moment can be reduced uh, to the hope that Ukraine is going to be able to restore its territorial integrity and basically to defend its sovereignty. And then the question is, if this is the case, can we think about a Russian policy now when the war is not uh, over and when we know very well that different countries and here the contributions of the colleagues from different places was very important, uh, have a totally different idea, not simply how the war is going to end, but what is the desired outcome. Uh, and I was always trying basically to figure out that there are kind of a three camps in this. One much more realist camp, which basically said, listen, we should end up the war in the way that is going to be also acceptable to Russia, the other which basically said we should really hope for regime change because Putin is never going to stop. The problem is when you can stop him. And there is a certain even more radical camp who believe that the only kind of a Russia that is not going to be threatening to Europe is Russia that is going to disintegrate. The problem with all these three camps is, in my view, reduced to something at least for me very important. Uh, trying to see and trying to judge what Russia is doing in Ukraine People, for, in my view, very legitimate reasons, goes back to what uh, Nazis did during the World War II. But there is one major difference between Germany in 1945 and Russia today. And the major difference is that Germany is a country which didn't have a nuclear weapon. Uh, and from this point of view, it is critically important that nevertheless that we can imagine different outcomes. Uh, the very existence of nuclear weapons make many of these kind of talk scenarios and others very different. Uh, and this is why I do believe some of uh, uh, the questions that Kadri is raising are critically important. And they're critically important because they're pushing Europeans not simply to agree on what 
we try to basically do in order to stop Putin and to help Ukraine, but what we're imagining after this. And here again, I'm going very much agree with Pierre and in two weeks, ECFR is going to publish the results uh, of the major opinion polls that we did in Europe, but also India, China, Russia, Turkey. The truth is that as a result of the war, the West was getting united, but the non-Western countries didn't follow us. Uh, and what is critically important is not simply that they didn't fall on sanctions and things like this, but we can talk about Europe without Russia. We not, cannot talk about world without Russia because for many of these countries, unlike in the Cold War, they strongly resist to see this as a kind of return of the Cold War and they don't see themselves as being a swing states. They see themselves as a rising sovereign powers that basically have a totally different logic of behavior. And this is why it is quite important because European policy towards Russia is not going to be simply policy towards Russia, it's going to be policy towards the rest of the world. And then we'll go to the other point, which in my view is very much underlined in Kadri's paper is that, in my view, there are four things that very much explains European unity. First was the shock of what Putin did. And this is very important. Uh, people with different political positions and others, there was a moral reaction that he, what he did was unacceptable. And I basically do believe that Ger the German president Steinmeier uh, uh, formulated it best when he said, it's not simply that he violated the rules and he ended the game, he threw the, he cast the board on the floor. Uh, and as a result of it, you have this first moment of unity, which was basically people to realize the importance of the moment. But the second one, this was the role of the United States. In a certain way, when Kadri said that it was a leaderless unity, it was not a leaderless unity, it was a US-led unity. And the biggest question is that one of the results of the Western consolidation is that the idea of the Europe as the autonomous centers of power, in my view, is kind of a less convincing and persuading today than it was before the war started. Even more, the basic question that we should ask is, can European unity survive if the domestic divides in the United States is going basically to put America in a different position? So when you see President Trump, who is uh, running for the next elections, attacking the decision of the American government to give tanks uh, to Ukraine, uh, this is asking the question, and in my view, this is an important paper, which probably CCR should write in the future, is can basically European Union sustain its unity, its fragile unity in the moment if basically there are going to be changes in the United States? Uh, and then uh, going to uh, the, the, the last two points, which particularly for me are very important, is how we can basically also treat the Russian opposition in the way that basically this is going to be part of the future policy of the European Union. And no, it, it, and this is a difficult question. And my answer is the following. As the paper says, there are certain countries who said it's a Putin war, uh, that this is the Russian's war. If we want to be effective, I do believe we should insist that it is a Putin's war, but we expected Russians to claim that it is a Russian's war. I mean, the opposition, because obviously Putin took the decision, but it is obviously that there is a level of resentment and level of public support for the war, which is very much there. Uh, and as a result of it, how we are defining the war as Putin's war and Russia's war is not simply what we do believe is really is happening in Russia, but also what kind of a discourse we want to have on post-Putin's Russia. This is for me a kind of a strategic choice to be made. And from this point of view, interestingly enough, the Americans, they're very much in a classical Cold War narrative. You have a bad regime, but people are okay. And one day people are going to liberate themselves from the regimes. For historical and other totally uh, legitimate reasons, both Ukrainians and some of the countries that have been under Soviet occupations much more try to essentialize this as the Russian's war, not simply Russia's war, but basically the war that is very much in the imperial DNA of the Russian nation. This is going to make it very difficult for European Union to have policy towards Russia, even when Putin is not there. So from this point of view, this is not simply a moral question, it's very much a strategic question, how we are framing. And here comes my last point about the role of the, uh, of the opposition. Uh, because first of all, the biggest problem of any opposition which is in exile is how to be legitimate both outside of the country and inside of the country. 
listen, <laughs> the story is that in order to be legitimate outside of Russia, the Russian opposition basically cannot be distinguished from the position of the Ukrainians. It is not simply basically to, uh, uh, to be critical towards the war, but they should be critical towards the war in a very particular way. On the other side, if we believe that even when President Putin is still not there, there are going to be some competitive politics in Russia, of course, this position is going to make it very difficult for the opposition to compete. Uh, because it's very difficult to win elections in every country if you basically are going to blame your own society for all the evils in the world. And this is a very difficult choice because here you have a tensions between the moral feeling of the people because the things that the Russians are doing in uh, Ukraine is totally unacceptable. And many Russians are basically supporting it. And on the other side, the strategic uh, decisions that European societies, but also uh, the European media is going to take, which is going to make a possibility for the European policy with respect to Russia, even when President Putin is not there anymore. So from this point of view, this tension between being strategic and at the same time basically supporting Ukraine in the terms Ukraine wants us to support them, this is a type of a tension which I do believe exists and it is going to be very critical for the possibility of any European Union's policy in Russia in the long term. Thank you very much, Ivan. And um... Thank you also for underlining that uh, questions about our um, Russia strategy are not only long term questions, but also very immediate questions about what we do with Russian exiles in Europe, um, etc. Um, we've invited three of the national researchers who contributed to this power audit to um, give their view on how the global European picture articulates with the vision in their own country. Um, maybe we start with you, Adam, because your country, Poland, um, sees itself very much as a front runner of, um, of European unity on the support to Ukraine. So how do you um, relate the results of um, our study to what you see in Poland? Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, in that case, I'm going to describe uh, Poland uh, and to maybe share a little bit more. I don't have a lot of time, so I will share maybe very briefly my uh, personal opinion on certain issues. So first of all, of course, there is a widespread support. That's something obvious for Ukraine. And we are for, uh, definitely forerunners of this idea that uh, uh, more sanctions, uh, more military support, and then, of course, we need to achieve something on the battlefield against Russia. We need to defeat Russia, and then we can talk. That's uh, very briefly the idea which is uh, highly popular in Poland among our society and political elite. Of course, we are not alone, and uh, we are aware of that, that, uh, in fact, uh, the war uh, provoked uh, some kind of uh, thinking of uh, our relations with certain partners uh, within the EU. Definitely, you can observe that uh, there is an uh, uh, obvious uh, deterioration of cooperation with Hungary, with uh, uh, Orange government. We have also this feeling that uh, uh, this war is a very serious threat to our national security, and that's why real friends are not in the south, but rather in the north. So Baltic states definitely is a little bit like right now, like Eurovision. Uh, then you have uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, which is not the EU member state, of course, but uh, I will return to Norway, uh, Denmark and Finland. That's why we are also very strongly supportive of uh, membership of these countries in the NATO. And in the South, still, uh, Czechia, we have some problems with Slovak society, but not with Slovak government, the current government. But we are aware of the fact that there is a tension between the government and the society regarding the war. Nevertheless, I mentioned Norway because I think here we are. Uh, moving smoothly to uh, the NATO, which of course, because of the war, became uh, very important for Poland, and as a main point of reference, definitely. And here, uh, besides the US, 
Uh, we can find also this feeling that we can count on the United Kingdom and uh, in Europe. I would say that uh, if you want I'm afraid we lost Adam. Adam, are you still there? Okay, maybe then uh, we'll move to another researcher and come back to Adam a bit later when he joins again. Um, Susanna, your country, Hungary, is described in the policy brief out as the outlier um, with very distinct positions on a number of issues, including, of course, the sanctions policy. Uh, what do you make of this difference between um, Hungary's position and the overall um, European picture? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, indeed, uh, the Hungarian position has been uh, an outlier. And if we uh, go back to what Pierre was saying, that uh, the very, uh, in the meantime, Adam is back, maybe. Uh, yeah, you're right. Maybe we let Adam finish okay. and then sorry, yeah, come back sorry. to you. Sorry. <laughs> No, what happened? And maybe Russian secret service. Okay, I'm joking, of course. Okay, so uh, definitely um, there is a disappointment in uh, if you compare Poland, for example, with uh, Lithuania, Estonia, and so on, with uh, German's performance. But in the case of Poland, it's much more serious, and that's uh, that's quite worrying because, in fact, Germany is uh, unfortunately quite often and. Uh, uh, presented uh, by our government as sort of a second enemy. And uh, this kind of rhetoric, uh, unfortunately, uh, is resonating among quite many polls, uh, according to opinion polls uh, conducted at the end of the last year. For instance, more than 40% of polls uh, uh, sub subscribe to this opinion that Germany is also our enemy. And more than half of uh, Poles uh, um, declared that they believe that, uh, unfortunately, Germany wants to subdue uh, Poland uh, uh, using as uh, the U.S. instrument in, by instrument of the EU. So that's that's a problem. That uh, it's not just disappointment and rational criticism of Germany. That's something more serious. The second issue, which is for, in my opinion, and we have elections this year, and it's going to escalate. And as you know, uh, the opposition is presented as the fifth column of Germany and also with Russia. And that's crazy that because of this polarization. You can uh, hear very, very often these accusations that uh, almost everyone is a uh, Russian spy. That's a problem. Uh, and then we have this, uh, that's my personal uh, opinion that uh, what, uh, what, what is wrong with me also that uh, there is this widespread uh, uh, self perception that we are really great experts on Russia, and I'm not so sure about that. It's also relevant uh, to the EU as such. Uh, I um, I think I don't have the time to react to Ivan and Pierre. I have uh, um, certain different positions on certain issues. Uh, nevertheless, for instance, I think that we should take much more into equation and, and pay much more attention, for instance, to the issue that uh, uh, these were contributed to uh, China's uh, 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 increasing, increasing uh, China's uh, uh, influence in Russia regarding especially economy. And uh, for instance, it was very simple that uh, last year during uh, the summer, for the first time, uh, uh, China surpassed us, overcome us as the most important, as it means the entire EU as the most important trade partner of Russia. That's something. And it's going to increase, for instance. So we have to take into account that in this game, uh, in, in our policy towards Russia, we have to take uh, into consideration China and then 
Uh, Russia, this one is showing that Russia is a multi ethnic state uh, with many non Russian. Uh, nations of Russia and also immigrants, illegal and illegal, and it's very important for the future of Russia. And here again, I can show with you, uh, share with you quite many examples of uh, uh, statements uh, showing, unfortunately, on our side, uh, huge ignorance and ignorance, including, for instance, this belief that uh, 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 ethnic Russians, uh, um, they make uh, majority, uh, the majority of soldiers fighting in Ukraine. They are all represented, but they don't uh, make this uh, uh, majority. And second point, uh, look at elites. They are crucial. If you want to change Russia in the future, definitely this country should become um, a genuine federation and people from minorities for, uh, of uh, immigrant background, they should get the representation in the center of power. So I'm stuck here. Thank you very much. Um, and it's interesting that um, the the issue of the war and, and the policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia is also coming in addition to some bilateral issues that member states have between themselves, uh, as you mentioned, between Poland and Germany. Susanna, let's come back to you uh, to hear a word from Hungary. Uh, yes, so Pierre was mentioning that um, there is kind of a feeling in Europe that we want to be out of this war, but also we want to be in to help. Now, I think there is a very straightforward attitude towards this in the case of Hungary. The Hungarian government wants to be out of this war completely, and it does not uh, seek to, to help uh, Ukraine. Um, the Hungarian government's position uh, was fairly consistent uh, over the past one year when it comes to what it prioritizes, and that is uh, keeping business as usual, uh, maintaining its uh, bilateral economic and uh, energy, especially energy ties uh, with Russia. So it pursues a fairly uh, self-centered approach. In fact, um, I would even argue that uh, its attitude is kind of a refusal uh, to the idea that the European Union should have played any sort of role uh, in this war. Um, and one of the reasons why the Hungarian government uh, views that uh, is because it does not think that the EU has any sort of uh, tools that uh, would in any way influence the situation, for one. For two, uh, it does not see um, overall foreign policy as something that should be uh, dealt with on a European level, uh, and especially not if it um, in any way go against, goes against its own uh, priorities. So what we have been seeing over the past um, almost one year by now is a consistent calls for ceasefire and peace talks, um, which are not really called for uh, out of humanitarian interests, but precisely because Hungary, the Hungarian government wants to return to business as usual and wants to conduct its relations with Russia in peace without any sort of uh, influence from the European Union. Um, this is why the Hungarian government has been uh, very much opposing the sanctions, especially those that would have been uh, really sensitive, um, targeting the energy sector. Um, and this is why I would say we are seeing an escalation again in the Hungarian government's rhetoric when it comes to uh, opposition to sanction, but also um, a reframing of the situation on the ground and framing Ukraine as essentially already a failed state just this past week, if you have seen those comments from Prime Minister Orban, um, arguing that Russia has by now already managed to ruin Ukraine. This is a country that's ungovernable. Um, this is practically like Afghanistan and no man's land, of course. Uh, Ukraine is by no means <laughs> no man's land, but this sort of rhetoric 
serves precisely the purpose uh, to support uh, the Hungarian government's argumentation that the sanctions didn't achieve anything and any further sanctions would not achieve, of course, anything anymore either. Because, well, if Ukraine is already a failed state, as the Hungarian government argues, that there's no point to any further sanctions. And we need to see that this sort of escalation now comes in the context when sanctions would likely start to target those areas that are particularly sensitive for the Hungarian government that is nuclear. Uh, why is that important? Just very briefly, for two particular reasons. One is that um, the existing nuclear power plants uh, in Paksh, in Hungary, which are responsible for, uh, if I remember correctly, about 50% uh, of the country's uh, electricity consumption uh, are running on uh, Russian nuclear fuel, and there has been no intention from the Hungarian government to find any uh, other uh, way to deal with the situation. There have been constant uh, nuclear fuel supplies over the past one year. Um, and for two, because of the construction of the uh, new two, react two new reactors of uh, the uh, Pax2 uh, power plant, which are done uh, using in part Rosatom's technology, in part also actually uh, technology from, from Atom and Siemens, uh, which the Germans now seem to be uh, blocking, uh, but also from a Russian loan. And this is a particularly sensitive uh, issue for the Hungarian government, the uh, details of which are in very standard uh, fashion are not transparent and public. So we do not know what exactly are the conditions for the loan that uh, is financing the construction of the nuclear power plant. Uh, but it's fairly possible that um, the fall through of the construction would be uh, very painful for the Hungarian government. So this is why we now see an escalation and going forward with the 10th uh, sanction package, I believe we will see the same blackmailing from the Hungarian government that we have seen uh, in previous cases, which ultimately, in my assessment, will serve to guarantee some sort of an exemption again uh, for, for Hungary in order to prevent, again, the bilateral ties uh, with Russia. So what would Hungary want to see? Uh, the Hungarian government, again, I need to underline that the Hungarian government's position. Um, the Hungarian government would like to see, regardless of what happened over the past one year, uh, a return to business as usual and no um, influence from European partners, from the European institutions into its bilateral dealings with Russia. Um, so in that regard, um, Hungary, the Hungarian government wants things to just be unaltered and return to the status quo. Ante. Thank you, Susanna. And yeah, one could argue that so far the uh, um, Hungarian government has never been an obstacle to adopting the various sanctions packages and settled for some concessions um, that corresponded its interests. But um, the question is how long you could consider that this is unity um, or that it's completely um, a divergent uh, pathway. Livia, let's come to you now. You're from Portugal, a country that is not so vocal in the overall debate, but mostly with the mainstream European position. So how do you view um, the global picture and how does it articulate with what you hear um, in, in, in your country? Yes, hi. So uh, it's great to join all of you and thanks for the invitation, uh, Marie and Kadri. Um, I'll try to organize my remarks in three, three points. Um, I think it's important to um, underline as a point of depart that uh, Portugal is in a very, very different position from uh, Hungary or Poland. Um, Portugal and Russia are possibly the farthest away countries in Europe. Uh, and moreover, for, for most of the 20th century, the two countries did not even have diplomatic relations. So Russia is not a country that the Portuguese are very familiar with or think of as being friendly. 
Instead, it is somewhat perceived as a bit threatening, but more in an abstract way, very far in space and time. And to a large extent, this explains why within Portugal's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there still is no department or desk specifically for Russia. And more importantly, why Portugal does not have an autonomous strategy regarding Russia or the war in Ukraine. And um, I believe it is fair to say that in this domain, Portugal only has preferences and expectations. Um, in fact, Portugal's position is to remain faithful to its commitment, commitments as a founding member of NATO and seek as far as possible to contribute to a common EU position. And on this, Portugal will tend to follow the lead of other countries within precisely NATO and the EU, and is very much part of the quiet majority it, as Kadri um, usually calls the majority of the, of the countries. My second point concerns the different weights of Russian and Ukrainian communities in Portugal, and also the way Lisbon views Ukraine's admission to the European Union. So the community of Russian expatriates uh, in Portugal is quite small, with no more than 5,000 Russian citizens. And the few Russians that live here are almost always being ignored, but sometimes even put in uh, quite delicate situations. Uh, for years, this is an example, for years, the Lisbon, Lisbon City Hall used to send to the embassy of the Russian Federation all the data, names, phones, contacts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of Russian citizens who living in Portugal took part in demonstrations against the, reg the Russian regime or, for example, in uh, demonstrations in support of Alexander Navalny. Uh, why am I telling you this? Because the media reported this in the summer of 2021, and it resulted in a big scandal. And as a result, the then mayor of Lisbon, who happens to be now our Minister of Finance, uh, un unexpectedly lost local elections uh, to the candidate of the largest opposition party. So since then, in fact, the media and the public opinion in general tends to pay a little more attention to the Russian community, although it continues to be a very, very quiet community, especially when compared to the Ukrainian community that is here in Portugal almost 10 times larger. And this is quite striking because usually other countries in, in the rest of Europe don't know this, but the Ukrainian community in Portugal is the second largest foreign resident community with around 50,000 nationals. They are perfectly integrated migrants with a reputation for being, for example, excellent workers. And thus, since the outbreak of the war, the solidarity of the Portuguese with the Ukrainian has been very evident and has materialized in financial and military support, the support possible for a country like Portugal, which is, of course, far from rich. And yet, beyond this undeniable solidarity, in the case of Ukraine, Portuguese foreign policy has also shown as in so many other European countries, a clear tension between values and interests, a bit like um, uh, Ivan Krasev was referring to. And this tension is revealed mainly in the resistance the government in Lisbon has shown to the possibility of a rapid accession of Ukraine to the European Union. Despite recognizing the centrality of this process, to the consolidation of democracy in the country, in Ukraine, Lisbon cannot help thinking how, if it comes into effect, Ukraine's accession to the EU will intensify Portugal's geographical, political, and economic periphery. And this is perhaps a price that Lisbon is not prepared to pay for the stabilization of Europe, at least in the very near future. And my third and final point concerns what most worries the Portuguese about 
the, the, the ongoing war. So Portuguese authorities and the Portuguese public opinion uh, were quite shocked uh, when the war started. Uh, Portugal is a country that highly values multilateralism and diplomacy, and it firmly believes and continues to believe, uh, also from its histo uh, historical experience with uh, dictatorship, that a uh, uh, well-functioning international order can only be based on mutually accepted rules and on uh, economic cooperation. In simplified terms, um, Portugal and the Portuguese would like for the war to end as soon as possible uh, as the result of uh, diplomatic initiatives, including from the UN. Uh, the Portuguese always have high hopes for the UN Secretary General, who coincidentally is Portuguese. However, almost a year after the start of the war, these expectations seem less and less uh, plausible. So what worries the Portuguese more and more um, are the indirect costs of the war on their way of life. Um, although Portugal is not dependent on energy coming from Russia, nor the two countries have had serious commercial relations, the Portuguese economy is quite, quite fragile and uh, it depends heavily on global trade and foreign investments made in the country. So the margin for resilience in Portugal is very short. And it is likely that if the war continues to drag on and the consequences of the war continue to be felt in the daily life of the Portuguese as they are already being felt, the Portuguese will start to ask more intensively for a quick peace, even if this will have some ter territorial costs for Ukraine. Of course, this is the worst case scenario, but because we are seeing the war that is dragging on, I think, unfortunately, this is a very, very realistic scenario here in Portugal. Thank you so much, and over to you, Marie. Thank you very much, Livia. And what you described is obviously one more factor for fragility of the European unity as the war hits in a very asymmetrical way the various EU countries. Um, we have a bit more than half an hour to continue this discussion, and we already have two questions from the public um, in the Q&A section. Um, two questions for our speakers, one of them addressed specifically to Pierre Vimont, but I guess others will also have things to say. Um, so let's start with these two questions. And of course, um, the public is welcome to ask more questions in the Q&A section. So first question, is it fair to say that if not for the US position, it would not be possible for the EU to have a common position towards Russia, as fragile as it is, and there would be a multitude of individual positions of European states? Or would the EU still be able to form a common position, but a different one from what is now? And so, and if so, what should this position be? Um, and the second question addressed to Pierre Vimont, but again, feel free to answer. Um, so when discussing fragility, what could help is to develop a common view on um, a reasonable end state um, and about the future relationship with Russia and Ukraine. So how would you at this stage describe this end state and the desirable relationships um, where we could focus on as a common view in order to continue to have unity? Or is it dangerous to start this discussion uh, because the discussion in itself would increase the fragility? So Pierre, maybe we start with you. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, with pleasure, Marie, uh, with pleasure. Um, the, whole, the whole question of uh, having a common policy towards Russia uh, between the 27 member states, um, going back to what Ivan was saying, we may have today a Ukrainian policy, we have no Russian policy, is that I think we were never able to have a Russian policy among the 27 of us uh, since, uh, I would say, uh, the uh, enlargement of 2004 for very obvious and 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 uh, reasons uh, which is the the difference of history and geography between uh, 
the then new East European partners, uh, members who came in, and more uh, of the um, uh, Western European uh, uh, members that were on a different line because they didn't have the same historical and geographical uh, uh, position. Uh, there was a lot of legacy, historical legacy there, going back to the Helsinki Agreement, for instance, that is being perceived as West Europeans as a great success of diplomacy uh, and something that allowed for a, a long time of cooperation and detente, whereas uh, our East European partners had a totally different opinion about the Helsinki Agreement, and uh, understandably so. Um, that was, uh, and this has been there since 2004, and we haven't been able to overcome that difficulty. If you go back time and again to Javier Solana's efforts, then his followers, uh, Cathy Ashton, uh, Federica Mogherini, Javier, uh, Joseph Borrell today, uh, they have never been able to find some kind of common ground about, among the EU member states. And my concern is that I don't think the Ukrainian crisis will help find a common position. Uh, because as it was said by many of the uh, speakers, um, differences are huge there. Um, even with regard to the simple first step that we should need to make, um, which is, in my opinion, going back to the question that was raised, how to start a conversation between us, 27 member states, on Russia, on a Russian policy? Where can we have that discussion, even if in a very confidential way? My hope personally was that maybe the European political community was the right place to start that discussion very informally, very openly about how do we uh, look at Russia now that the war um, has, uh, has um, uh, opened up in, in, in Ukraine. We have to revisit the whole European order. We can't just start from where we were. I think everything, the old world has somewhat disappeared and we have to build a new European uh, world in, in the future and a new European order. Where to start? Um, um, from the questions that were put forward by Ivan about Russian opposition, uh, a possibility of a Russian change and what will then happen to a, 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 new, a, a new Russia that may be um, in, in disarray and in complete turmoil after a regime change. Um, how to act towards that? And for the time being, I see no answer there because it's either one camp that is saying we have to leave it to the Russians um, and put them in a sort of uh, isolation, if no, not containment policy, and wait for changes to appear there. Um, and those of the second group who are saying um, we need by a way or another to help that change move in the right direction in an orderly way so that we don't get the disorderly fallouts of a, of a major change in Russia. Uh, my point is there may be no answer for the time being, but at least it would be interesting to start a conversation there. They have tried about six or eight months ago in meetings of uh, foreign affairs ministers in Brussels. It hasn't gone very far um, uh, because there is a lot of untold stories there and um, um, issues that need to be um, put there uh, openly with an honest and candid conversation among 27 member states. Um, and you can't do it in those very formal meetings in Brussels. You have to do it in informal meetings, groups of country. Um, we speak, uh, we hear a lot, a lot of fragmentation inside the European Union today, groups of countries, et cetera. These different groups need to meet together and start a very informal dialogue in trying to understand the point of view of each other. And for me, this is the first step. You can't come out with a definitive answer to what should be a Russian policy for the time being. Differences are huge. You need to start a very slow pace, good conversation about bringing out some of the devils of the past and being open about this and discuss this. I'll stop there, Marie. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. And Ivan, maybe you have um, an, thoughts you can share about both the US role and, um, and a possible end state or whether we should start a conversation about the end state. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very much going to fall where uh, Pierre started because the, the biggest problem is, of course, the United States were critically important for having a united position. By the way, the other force that was critically important was the Ukrainian's resistance. The common position is also the problem of capacity. And from this point of view, the fact that uh, the Ukrainian society, the Ukrainian army have been able uh, to defend themselves uh, is something that was critically important for having the unity that we have. America was not going to be enough. Uh, and uh, this is quite important because uh, you're going to see in the opinion polls that, uh, 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 that I have been announcing to be published, European public has moved in the last one year more from the position that probably Ukraine's victory is the only way out. And one of the major reasons for this was exactly the Ukrainian victories on the battlefield. But here, Europe is really very much squeezed between two fears. One is the fear that Russia is going to succeed and then basically we're opening the Pandora box and nobody knows which is going to be the next border that is going to be violated. But the other is the fear of a nuclear war. And this kind of a two fears are squeezing Europeans. And we have a very difficult conversations because also what Pierre uh, very clearly outlined is that when it comes to Russia, countries not simply have asymmetrical values and interests, they have very asymmetrical experiences. People normally talk about uh, the division between East and West. To be honest, the major divisions are within the East and within the West. Hungary is the East European country. By the way, even a frontline country like Romania is not on the same place where Poland or the Baltic republics are. So from this point of view, renegotiating these positions is going to be very difficult because historical memories are very different. Uh, Eastern Europe fears occupation. Western Europe fears nuclear war. And this type of a, a story makes it possible, the only position now, the default position is to try to help and uh, basically uh, help Ukraine to do their best to restore their, uh, uh, to restore their territory. The biggest problem with this is that at some point, when many Europeans said they should be concessions, the Ukrainian response is going to be, if you want concessions from us on territory, then we want concession from you, and this is member of the European Union. Uh, and this was very much what the Ukrainian prime minister said just yesterday, saying that he sees Ukraine in the European Union in two years. Uh, so, and to be honest, it's easy to be critical to the maximalism of the Ukrainians, but you don't have any option if you're them. <laughs> in a certain way, they, they don't have any other option because either they're going to make the war, the war between Russia and the West, or they're going to lose the war. <laughs> Nevertheless, of what we're saying, because Ukraine's success very much depends on the weapons coming from the West, the financial support coming from the West, between 8 and 10 billion per month is just the financial support. And this is putting the Europeans in this very difficult position that Pierre describes, we want to win the war without being part of it. And this is what makes the victory so difficult. We want Ukrainians to want for us, but on the other side, we want a victory that is going to allow certain type of relations with Russia uh, that is functional in one way or the other. And uh, uh, and for me, this is kind of the real tension. And I don't believe that at this moment we can come with any type of working consensus. There are people who prefer to see Russia like the political version of the Chernobyl nuclear power station, something that should be contained and nobody be talked about. As I said, I don't believe this is going to work because this is not how the rest of the world is seeing Russia. And on the other side, we cannot allow uh, talk about the outcome that are going to be so divisive that this fragile unity that we have basically achieved uh, is going to be destroyed. Thank you. Uh, before we... Um... Come to the second round of questions. Kadri, a number of the issues we've just discussed are actually mentioned in your policy brief, be it the fear of nuclear war, um, the, the, the position of the US, etc. Do you want to come in and um, yeah, add your remarks? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, just a few remarks. Um, 
US and, uh, and Ukraine have been mentioned uh, as um, countries that have helped Europe to be united. I would actually also add Russia. I think Russia's behavior during the war has actually made it easier for the EU to maintain united position. I mean, Russia's brutal behavior in Ukraine and Putin's total refusal to revise its war aims away from maximalist scenario. Uh, I mean, Greece have basically made it sure that European position is now focused on supporting Ukraine and countries and politicians who advocated diplomatic solutions, whatever it would have meant in the early months of the war, have fallen silent about that option by, by now. So I think, you know, that has also helped our unity, if I may say so, if we, if we consider that a help. On the US role, I think that is crucial. I, I saw the question, yes, that without the US, you know, we would not be without the US, we would be with a different US. And I mean, I am never good in sort of predicting different scenarios in greater detail, but I think during the Trump era, we got a glimpse of what a different US would mean. Uh, it would be partisan, it would be mishandling its domestic debate, and European countries, some of them would still feel existential need to gravitate towards the US, regardless of anything, because they view their security as dependent uh, on the US, and that's mostly the Eastern side, whereas Western side would think that, why do we need to go along with everything Washington is proposing. Many of them would view that as sort of many things coming from Washington as reckless adventure. So I think we are really lucky that the current US administration seems to be um, sort of fair arbiter, uh, also between these different European fears, yeah, uh, occupation and nuclear war, especially I think nuclear war because US has a culture of discussing nuclear issues. Europe has much less of that. And you can, even in our survey, you could see imbalances. I mean, France is the only nuclear power in the EU. And the outlook from Paris is, is different from that of many other countries that actually lack the nuclear culture. They lack knowledge. They, they lack base to discuss. And my fear is that if for some reason US position drastically changes, nuclear debate in Europe might become a faith-based exercise. Countries using the nuclear argument to justify their preset views. I mean, many in the Baltic states or Poland would totally dismiss Russia's nuclear uh, blackmail as, as bluff. Whereas many other countries would be, uh, would be taking it much more seriously and have existential fear. So I think that's one, one issue on which we actually could work even now to try to bring the Europeans slightly more, more together because I mean, one of our sovereign European researchers from a smaller country fairly honestly said that, listen, we have no clue if nuclear escalation is likely or not. And I think actually that is fear of many other countries as, as well. So when nuclear issues Europe very likely will be discussing something it doesn't properly understand. Thank you. Um, if you agree, I will give the national researchers a possibility to do final comments, but um, I would propose that we move now to the second round of questions because we have a lot of them. Um, so two questions pertain to um, relations with the EU. Uh, one of them is, is about the five principles that were adopted in 2016. Um, can we consider them as a common EU position um, uh, for EU policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Another one is about um, the tenets of EU's post-war approach to Russia. Um, with the objective of preventing the repeat of aggressive militaristic revanchism. So what could be these fundamental tenets? <coughs> um, 
Another question on uh, future EU-Russia relationship. Could one also think of an EU-NATO double-track military de deterrence support for Ukraine and an offer for economic cooperation to a peaceful Russian leadership after the withdrawal from Ukraine? Um, and two other completely different questions. One about the borders and the discussion around Crimea. Um, can a so um, could there be unity on the basic principle that uh, borders cannot be changed by force and can be changed only by agreement? Um, and would that be a way to address the Crimea question? Um, and one last question about the rest of the world. Uh, let me read it. Regarding the Global South, I noted the statements by um, the Bra Brazilian president during the visit by Scholz, clearly condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It may offer some possibility of fractures in the BRICS um, and contrast to the reactions in South Africa and statements during the recent Lavrov visit um, to South Africa. Um, so maybe the Brazilian president could become very useful in changing some positions or attitudes in Latin America and Africa. Um, and what would uh, what investment by the West would be needed for that? I think I've asked all the questions that we had from the public. Um, Ivan, can we start with you this time? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the last question and uh, uh, allowing others uh, to go because one of the things, and you're going to see, we're going to present much more data, as I told you, on two weeks, and unfortunately, Brazil was not among the countries there, but uh, in Europe, when we see what is the future of the world, most of the people see it as kind of a type of a Cold War bipolarity, exactly because we are in a kind of a not so cold conflict with Russia these days. And because China and Russia are going closer together, what Adam have been mentioning, we see a certain type of a return to the Cold War type of international order. So as a result of it, we try to see others as a swing states, be it Brazil, be it basically India, being even NATO member like Turkey. Uh, uh, and what is important is that this is not how they see themselves. And this is the story. I don't believe that any of these countries particularly excited by what Russia did uh, in a certain way going and grabbing the territory of a neighboring country. But on the other side, they're not ready to act on the basis of principle and norms, but much more trying to maximize their relevance in the political system of the world, basically their economic and strategic interests. And as a result of it, you're going to see countries like India, which uh, in a certain way enjoy the current situation because now suddenly they became much more important than they have been before. As a result of it, I do believe that the most important decision for long term that European Union is going to do is how to deal with the rest of the world, how important basically the isolation of Russia as an agenda is going to be in a global policy of the European Union, keeping in mind that European Union, in my view, in the next decade, is going to have a much more limited economic relations with Russia, and we are going to be much less dependent on Russian natural resources and others, which means that we should get these resources from somewhere else. And how we're going to do this, and how this is going to be done, is going to be critically important because, and this is my last point, the others also try not to see European Union as a particularly distinctive player anymore. One of the impact of this uh, uh, Russia war in Ukraine is that the idea of the West returned and very much the Cold War West, of course, in different borders. Some of the traditional allies are not there, but they see the United States and European Union together. So what kind of policy? How are you going to do this policy? This is critically important, particularly keeping in mind that we know what we want to happen in Russia but we are not be able to do it ourselves. And this is one of the important stories. We can expect Russian society to go in one or the other way. But uh, what we know in political science, there is a major difference between decay and collapse. Regimes can decay for decades. And from this point of view, the timing of policy is the other thing that is going to be a major challenge to the European Union. How to make a difference between the long-term policies and also responses to the immediate crisis that we see now. Uh, 
thank you. Adam, you wanted to come in and to react to uh, what Ivan was just saying. Adam, we can't hear you. Maybe it's because of the hearset. <laughs> it is better than before. Yes, yes it's much better. Thank you. I got info from you that uh, there was some technical problem. So very briefly, I think yes, it is crucial to uh, prepare also our strategy, uh, which is is going to um, take into account the diversity of the world. Because at first of all, we should, in in my opinion, avoid this uh, term global, the global south, uh, the rest of the world. I prefer, for instance, after uh, the start of, after the launch of full-scale Russian aggression, uh, the economists prepared this weekly, um, divided countries into five categories and prepared uh, uh, a sort of map showing uh, the attitude towards the war. And uh, countries who are pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, inclined, inclined uh, uh, towards uh, Ukraine, inclined towards uh, uh, Russia and neutral. So I think we should uh, realize that uh, the world is much more complex. That's first point. The second point is that uh, we don't have some kind of Russian Chinese axis. Uh, we should prepare ourselves that we have a really senior partner, uh, China, and a junior partner. Russia. And uh, I'm afraid that what we can expect that this asymmetrical relationship, will, uh, which is right now very, uh, which is, as I said, deepening and which, which is very asymmetrical, uh, will uh, uh, increase this uh, uh, Chinese le uh, leverage uh, on Russia and influence. And the third point. Um, also, we should take into account these regions, again, um, the term which is right now obsolete, the post-Soviet space. There is no any more post-Soviet space. We have Central Asia, Caucasus, the, uh, the Black Sea region, and so on. And we should take into account that, uh, again, certain uh, players, actors are on the rise in this uh, region because Russia is declining. One of them is China. Definitely, but of course we have this uh, medium-sized power like Turkey, and we should also that's that's for us uh, a chance, but a challenge at the same time in this uh, country. And again, very important elections uh, this year. Thank you very much, Adam, for this um, these remarks, um, Pierre. Yes, Marie, uh, maybe. Uh... A quick answer on, on, on the question that was put about, can we get back to the five principles of 2016? And, and in other words, to the kind of uh, European order we were trying to build. No, I don't think so. By the way, the five principles didn't apply <laughs> very much uh, and were highly contested very early on. So um, I, I, I think the real issue we've got there is maybe not only a European issue, but uh, an issue about the new world order Ivan was, was talking about, is how do you rebuild some kind of world order and the rules and principles that go with it when those rules so far have been totally violated um, uh, by one major country who is, by the way, a permanent member of uh, the UN Security Council. Because what is at the heart of Ukrainian war is the violation of some of the um, uh, simple principles of uh, territorial integrity and uh, nation sovereignty, uh, non-violation, respect of the borders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to rebuild all of this. And the point I was trying to make, which goes very much along what Ivan was saying, is that the best way for the Europeans to work on this is to go and, and find allies and uh, partners 
in the global world. Um, it's India, it's Brazil, and uh, it's South Africa, if they're able to change. It's Egypt, uh, it's, um, it's Mexico, uh, Argentina, whatever, uh, Singapore, the Philippines. Um, it is with these partners that we are able maybe to put forward a European message that would be forceful um, and could be listened to. I think to some extent that um, the mistake we're making at the moment um, is in relation to the both the military dimension and the political and diplomatic dimension of the Ukrainian crisis. We're trying to slow down um, our military um, um, uh, interference, our military intervention and our military presence. Hence, all the very long discussion on should we deliver tanks, uh, the kind of hesitation we have time and again, where I think we should speed up our military response and our military assistance to Ukraine. Whereas on the diplomatic and political front, we thought at the beginning that there was a lot of place there for us to work quickly. Hence the, the grain deal, uh, uh, the exchange of prisoners, uh, uh, the whole issue about the Saporizhia nuclear plant. Those uh, conversation, those diplomatic efforts have slowed down now because it's becoming more and more difficult. And I think coming back to what I was saying about reinventing a new world order, this is going to be a very slow process and we're going to need time. We're going to have to find allies and we have to accept that this will require patience uh, and a long game work. Um, so we have to speed up on the military front. We have to accept to go slowly on the diplomatic front, it seems to me. Thank you very much. And we're actually running out of time, not only for diplomatic um, talks, but for our discussion. We have five minutes left, so I propose to go back to our national researchers for final comments and then to you, Kadri, um, for also a, a few final comments. Livia, shall, can I start with you? Yes, yeah, so I'll be very, very quick. Um, two things. The first one is that um, there's no strategic Europe for uh, Portugal without the United States. So what counts for Portugal is uh, US nuclear deterrence. So yeah, we have to, when we think about the European security architecture, we absolutely need to think uh, of the US also. Uh, of course, we know that Trump perhaps We'll be back in the White House. So if that really happens, Portugal is going to be really, really lost. I hope it doesn't happen, but we, we never know. Uh, the second one is the question of how Portugal understands multilateralism and its relation to the global south. Um, so uh, Portugal multilateralism for Portugal is um, uh, is, is going along well with everyone. And in, to a certain extent, it implies a kind of uh, neutral position in regards to other countries' interests and agendas. And, and in particularly, I think that's uh, really uh, obvious when Portugal relates to um, the Global South. Uh, just an example. When um, the, the, first, um, the first vote on the um, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine at the UN, our um, president was visiting Mozambique. And Mozambique was one of the countries who I think abstained. And instead of saying something to the political authorities in Mozambique, our president prefer not to say anything. So this is really, really worrisome because um, it's one thing to go and convince partners in the global south to understand what's really at, at stake here. It's another thing to believe that what's really important is to uh, have good relations with the other countries without raising sensitive issues. And I believe that other countries in Europe have, have the same position. 
And that really, really worries me um, a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Livia. Susanna, in one minute, if you can. I'll do my best. Um, so uh, in the course of the past 90 minutes, we've been talking a lot about uh, European unity. And uh, when it comes to especially relations with Russia, uh, we have to face the situation that at least one outlier will remain at the table in the foreseeable future. And if we can go by the past one decade, then this uh, one outlier government certainly uh, plans to remain at the table for longer beyond the next elections. So this raises the question, and not just in relation to Russia, I believe, but um, towards European foreign policy more general. Um, isn't it the time to really start talking about uh, how we can go on with foreign policy, not just on a united front, but also uh, using QMV uh, voting and potentially developing strategies along these lines? Uh, I understand that unity is, of course, always uh, stronger sends a stronger message, uh, but I think also the situation is kind of a wake-up call that uh, the European Union may want to consider moving forward, even if there is no unity in certain situations, and then consider what are the consequences of that. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, Adam, your turn. Also one minute. <laughs> Okay, very briefly, uh, maybe I will uh, make the world even, even more complicated for us. Uh, I think that I mentioned, for instance, uh, Central Asia or uh, the Caucasus, and in that case, uh, the rise of influence of certain external players. But let's think about the world that uh, quite often, uh, and this world is a very good evidence um, that uh, Ukrainians underestimated its potential, determination, and so on. So probably what we can observe right now, this rise of uh, uh, self-esteem and empowerment of certain players, uh, regional players, like for instance, uh, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan in Central Asia, Azerbaijan in the Caucasus. So let's think also about these actors, that we should really have this strategy, which is, uh, uh, a sort of a wide scope, taking into account into the picture not only these uh, uh, big sharks, but also smaller fishes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, also, more so as ECFR Wider Europe Programme is currently working on this region, so uh, we very much hope to be able to uh, publish some papers um, in yeah in a few weeks from now. Kadri, your final remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone. It has been a true privilege to get bad feedback uh, to our paper from, from all of you. I'm immensely grateful. Um, final words, um, maybe to say something about Russia and there were questions about how to prevent Russia's imperialism, what to offer to Russia, etc. I think the EU of the West might try to articulate some vision for Russia. It will necessarily be embryonic for, for now because so many things, including the future shape of Russia will be dependent on the outcome in that war. So we might be actually focusing on things that we do not expect to happen, but that would also help. And I think we shouldn't expect Russia's disintegration to happen. I say no preconditions for that. And people who speak about it, I think we are over applying the experience of uh, Soviet Union's collapse along the sort of uh, internal borders. I don't think that's in the cards for Russia or has it, nor has it ever been. I worked in Moscow in the 1990s. That was the heyday of separatism. No one but Chechnya at the time was, was truly serious about it. And I have my doubts about whether even Chechnya would be interested in that any, any longer. Um, 
And another thing, I don't think we should expect Russia to become rule taker in the ways it was in, in the 1990s. And that is something that I see discussed or actually feared among Russia's foreign policy elite. Their thinking is that if the West prevails in that conflict, Russia will be reduced to the position it had in the 1990s. I think that is mistaken. I, I think the West has understood that the unipolar moment has passed, that the policy to try to impose Western standards on all countries uh, has actually led us into, into big problems. And if we want to win the uh, conflict with Russia, actually we have to be a lot more accommodating towards the varieties of countries in, in the rest of the world. I think we could do slightly more to make that clear to Russians as well, because that shapes debates inside Russia. Currently, there is a danger that Russia sees the conflict as existential for Russia, whereas it needs not be. It might be existential for Putin. It needs not be existential for Russia. And for Russia, I think we should try to create space where it can learn from its mistakes. I remain hopeful that they can do that. And I think that war has been a mistake because whichever way it ends, even if Russia somehow gains a military victory, overall, it will still be a loss for Russia. It will reduce resilience of domestic system, Russia's leverage globally, room for maneuver, all these things will be diminished for Russia. So I think there remains hope that one day some lessons will be learned in Moscow as well. And once that happens, that'll be the best guarantee against Russia repeating the exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Kadri, for these words of hope. Um, we're a bit over time, um, but I'd like to take half a minute to thank again our speakers, Pierre Vimont, Ivan Krastev, um, Adam Balzer, Susanna Weg, Livia Franco and Kadri Leek for this wonderful discussion. Thank the audience for the good questions and encourage all who haven't read Kadri Leek's um, paper, The Old is Dying and the New Cannot Be Born, a Power Audit of EU-Russia Relations, to read it because it's really good. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>